Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West with one edition. Transmitting across the internet, this is episode, wait for it, Larry, episode 200 of Registry Matters. How are you, sir? Awesome. We, uh, we're right on time, aren't we? It's, uh, it's 15 minutes afterwards. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, some minor tech issues and getting everybody situated with the hundreds of people that are listening in for the uh, 200th, 200th episode. How are you? Well, actually, it is a larger audience than normal, and, and we are grateful that you're here, and uh, my lovely fiance is here, so uh, welcome to her. <laughs> um, your fiance is, is, is a married woman, Larry. That doesn't matter. I do not discriminate. I see. All right. Is everybody there on board with this whole plan? I don't see any objections so far. All right. Well, excellent. Uh, do you want to tell me what we have this evening? We have a special guest from, from the great state of West Virginia that's going to be balancing my liberal do-goodism. And we're going to be taking a couple of questions, three questions, I think, two from behind the walls and one that came in from gatekeeper at Narsal and we're going to be talking about public policy and when uh, people should whether they're in congress or whether they're in the state legislative bodies or whether whether they're they're in legislative seats or city council seats or county commissions when they should tell the people to go screw themselves and when they should actually represent the people and what the contours are for representing people and we're going to talk about oh, we're going to talk about the TV Adam please. Walsh Act pending regulatory the guidelines that are actually going to become final very soon here. But we're going to kick that around a little bit. It's generating a lot of interest around. Okay, uh, have we talked about that before by chance? We have indeed. We've definitely talked about Adam Walsh Act and the proposed regulations that were issued during the Trump administration, and now they're going to become final during the Biden administration. All right, then. Well, then uh, let's get going from this first one from the Narsal Gatekeeper. And this one says, uh, sorry, I've been super busy. That's just part of another conversation. I live in Bartow County and I register as homeless. Ever since I became homeless within a week of moving to Georgia, the sheriff's department has told me I have to text them every single night as soon as I reach my sleeping location. Yet, I can't for the life of me find a single law in the books that state this is a requirement of a homeless registrant in Bartow County or in Georgia. And honestly, it's very, very stressful because any night I've worked overnight or overtime, or excuse me, over overnight for overtime, I get harassed about it. Uh, the one or two nights I've forgotten, I've been harassed about it. And I constantly worry about being sent to jail over something as simple as not sending a text. It's one thing if it's on the books as a law but I don't see anything that makes it legal or gives them the ability to enforce it. Boy, I know what the answer is to this, Larry. I totally, totally know what the answer to this is. Can I say it? You do indeed. But uh, as we were in pre-show, I was thinking this was Bartow County, but it's actually a county that I've never heard of in Georgia. It is Barrow County. Yeah, okay. So I, I read north, that wrong. North Northeast Georgia. Well, I had said that I thought it was Bartow, but Georgia has 159 counties, which I think is the second highest number, largest number in the United States. And I don't even know them all, but yes, there apparently is a Barrow County. It has a 69,000 population, and it's kind of looks like it would be near Clark County and, and Athens area of Georgia. Oh, okay. All right. So, so you know the answer. Uh, so tell, tell people the answer, then we'll dig into it. The answer is they can do it until they are told to stop, just like the signs in Butts County, right? Correct. So we have actually, we meaning NARSL, and for those who have never heard that before, that's the National Association for Rational Sexual Offense Laws. We have actually litigated in Georgia against sheriffs who have invented requirements that are outside the law. And in pre-show prep, I went ahead and pulled the Georgia statute as represented by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation website, and it's available there for scrutiny. It was in the shared folder and 
as I went through that, my recollection was accurate. He, he's correct. There is nothing in the Georgia statute that requires a weekly text, I mean a nightly text, of a PFR in Georgia. But there was nothing in there that required a PFR to put up signs. There's a lot of things that law enforcement invents. But Georgia doesn't provide in their statute the opportunity for law enforcement to invent things. There's not no catch-all clause that says, and such other things as furthers the purpose of the sexual offender registration statute. And those clauses alone are unconstitutional because they're vague and they would be okay. properly challenged to be void for vagueness. But this issue was settled many years ago. I think we talked about it pre-show. So I put the case of Santos versus a state which dealt with a PFR who did not have a permanent address. And the Georgia law used to require them to provide a physical address, no PO box. And the Georgia Supreme Court has held 13 years ago now that that so you don't have an address, you don't provide an address. And the way I read from the GBI website is they have to report within 72 hours, a homeless person that is, with a, if they change their sleeping location. But I cannot find any reference to a nightly text. Okay. Um, so does he just like flip them the two middle fingers and say, I'm not doing it? I would not strongly encourage that uh, if, if he would do that. They, they would go, what they would do if he did take that approach, they would go and try to find the places where he is staying because he would be reporting something and they may even be GPS tracking him for all we know. Right? You never know what law enforcement they do with, with that, what they call that sting that uh, moves the cell phone tower around. I don't know all that technology, but for all we know, they're tracking him. They do track people surreptitiously by attaching devices to their cars. I don't know if they can do the same thing by cell phone technology, but if they're tracking him, what they would do is they would contact the entities that control the property where he's sleeping. It might be privately owned or it might be a public right-of-way under a bridge somewhere. And they would get him, they make sure he would receive directions that he's trespassing if he's on that public property or he's trespassing if he's on that private property. And they would upset the apple cart to where he would not be able to sleep there. That's what they would do. So I would not encourage that course of action. Then he has to go through the whole, I'm going to say it, Larry, the kabuki show of then finding an attorney and then going through and trying to file a challenge to do, to do something to get the attorney to act on his behalf to go stop. That is correct. And since the organization that I serve with the board we're interested in Georgia. We've put Georgia on our radar. It's very possible. I can't be premature, but it's very possible we might look at that. And it's possible we might send a cease and desist letter to Barrow County. But those are all possibilities because we work in team collaboration. Nobody makes unilateral decisions. So we would have to consider the pros and cons. And that could be a course of action we might choose. But being as this individual is homeless, Larry, I'm sure he doesn't go into his nightly room and go bathe in all of the $100 bills he earned for the day. Probably not. So, so what he, is a person he, in that sort of situation, how do they then file a legal challenge against the, the state? This isn't like your neighbor irritated you and you go to Judge Judy and you do some sort of small claims court. This is going to be thousands of dollars to do. Potentially, it might be a thousand of dollars, or it may be a cease and desist letter to the to the county attorney in Barrow and to the to the uh, Barrow County Sheriff's Office, possibly. Sometimes, on rare occasions, they see the light and they stop doing what they're doing. So, but yes, you're correct. If litigation were the only course of action, that's the reason why these things go unchallenged because a homeless person is in a very weak position. Generally speaking, they're not going to have those resources, nor are they going to have access to them. And the organizations that would be available to them, the first thing he would think of would be the ACLU. They're not likely to undertake this cause. They're not. Does this uh, have far reaching implications as far as like we talk about impact litigation? That's something that you are, you and others are, are mostly interested in. You're not interested in helping like the one person, but if it has some sort of greater impact for many more people, does this fall into that kind of category? It would indeed. It would be similar to what we're working on in Cobb County, which is the suburban Atlanta County. We're working on launching an action there because the sheriff. We don't know if they've changed, but the previous sheriff was inventing requirements about uh, work schedules and things that were not in Georgia law that people had to provide. 
So the greater impact would be, you did put your hand on the Bible and you swore to uphold the law and to enforce the law. If you would like to be a lawmaker, all 159 sheriffs in Georgia, you need to run for the Georgia General Assembly. But that's not your role to invent the law. And you're, you're going to be slapped down from time to time because if we find that you're inventing the law, there is someone watching. And one final question is about the separation of powers that um, I'm pretty sure that the sheriff is part of the executive branch and they don't have the power to invent laws, which comes from the legislative branch. Do I have that reasonably close? Reasonably close, yes. They are independently elected officials, but they do not have lawmaking powers. He, he or she, I don't know who the sheriff is in Farrell, but he or she is not able to invent the law. And when they tell someone to do something, as I said, they put their hand on the Bible and they were going to enforce the law as it's written. And that is not in Georgia law. And I don't know how they can invent that because you just can't tell people to do what you'd like them to do. You, you enforce what has been required of them. And they also need certainty in terms of what they can be required to do. That's the whole reason why we have laws and people don't just invent it as they go. Nobody would ever be safe. Right. I get, yeah. I mean, that would that would set up the minimum standard of what they're supposed to execute. But then at the same time, it creates the maximum of what they're allowed to do as well. So. So, yes, I will. I will be further investigating this claim in, in Barrow County. And it's possible we could be sending a letter to them. Cool. All right. Excellent. And then let's move over to this is a two parter, but this will be part one. And it says, thank you for sending me the transcript of the podcast. I'm glad and grateful that the issues discussed on this forum are being approached in some fashion. However, I'm not sure that the late night show with the live audience is the most appropriate format. The lighthearted semi-comic uh, tone seems a bit tone deaf to the situation where there are broken lives and broken homes, people languishing in prison for decades and facing lifetime ostracism and exclusion, social disdain until death. There really is very little to laugh about, unless the laughter is a kind of gallows humor. At one point in this transcript, there is a tangential conversation about a gentleman who travels with plumbing tools and his favorite showerhead that he installs in hotel rooms to avoid the occasional weak spray. In prison, we have no such luxuries, and I'm sure that those PFRs doomed to live in public shelters or on the streets don't either. Boy, oh boy. Well, that is from Fernando, who's spending some time with the feds and state of Texas. And we do appreciate the feedback as always. That episode that he happened to receive was recorded at an annual event. And we would have either not had an episode that week or we thought we would take advantage of the accumulation of 150 people and give them opportunity to see the show, the program live and to participate. So yes, there was some laughter and when we did the transcript, we made sure that the laughter was represented under the transcript. We put that in there purposely so that the people who were reading would feel like they were there as much as you could feel like you're there. In the terms of the showerhead, the person, that's me. That's the person we're talking about <laughs> with the showerhead. So yes, it I'm, is quite, I'm quite aware, uh, well aware that people in prison have have not the best showers. Uh, they have they they have short timers in many instances where you have to press the button over and over again. Sometimes you can invent bypass tools like putting cutting your coffee cup the plastic and you can put little wedges in. And most of the modern designs they fix they'll they'll it'll kick that it won't actually kick the plastic out but it'll turn the shower off even though you have a permanent wedge in there. That's what people used to do in the old days. But, you did it but, at the last place I was at. It would run, like, from the time that the showers were open, that thing was on at full tilt for, I don't know, six hours just running. So, yes, but but that that's not the point. The point I was making is when I travel, I'm getting up in years, and I pay decent money for the lodging, and I expect to be able to take a shower. I, we can't compare that with prison. Uh, prison, you get accommodations that are not intended to make you feel like you'd want to come back. When I go to a hotel, I'm they are hoping that I do come back in most instances. That's the whole point of the business is that we want repeat guests. They won't re they would like to have repeat guests. So I I don't feel any guilt about having a decent shower, but but I do recognize that people in prisons are not 
and luxurious accommodations. I would also, I, there, there's like a flurry of, com of comments being thrown out in chat. One of them is exactly. Otherwise, it's all doom and gloom. So we, we've had this comment come up before and we beat it around on how much lightheartedness we would do. But that's exactly it. This all sucks really, really bad for those that are still inside. And it sucks for a whole lot of people that are on the outside, obviously to varying degrees. Can't compare the people that are inside to the people that are outside. Same as you, Larry, you have the privilege and the freedom to travel with the shower head and replace it. Not trying to make that comparison. But at the same time, if all we do is come on here and go, this sucks and this is going to make your life worser. And I did say that on purpose. Then I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't personally live that way. So I am very snarky. I'm very sarcastic. I have a dry sense of humor. So, like that's just kind of the personality that I have. And I would apologize to the person sending in the comments that that's how this program exists, but that's kind of the character of it too. So, and in fact, I know that there's a large number in the audience right now, they're muted, but I could probably generate some laughter about my latest bathroom antic I've never talked about, <laughs> but, but at home, rather than having a hot lather machine, I have a old-fashioned technique for making sure my sh shaving cream is warm. So what I do is I take the cans of shaving cream and I put them in a small igloo of hot water. Because otherwise, if you put them in, in something that's not, uh, that doesn't have some insulating effect, the water would be cold by the time you get out of the shower. So I get out of the shower and my shaving cream is nice and warm. It's in the igloo and I have nice heated lather and it didn't cost me a dime. So, well, it did cost me a dime for the shaving cream, but it's nice and warm. And a friend of mine came over to try to light my furnace today, and, and he, he needed to use the bathroom, and he saw the igloo, and he said, why do you have an igloo in the bathroom? I said, everybody does. <laughs> of course they do, Larry. <laughs> Everyone has one in their bathroom. <laughs> every, every bathroom I've ever been in the last 10 years at least has an igloo sitting there, so I don't, I don't know what his problem was. I mean, yeah, don't me you too. Have one, don't you have one in yours? <laughs> <laughs> definitely um well what are the what are the people somebody, saying in chat chats how many how many of you in chat have an igloo in your bathroom the, the answer is going to be none but i will then just t <laughs> pile this on it says i think humor can be lost in a text transcript for that listener he could listen to the podcast and then he would hear the humor in the voice that's totally true and if this is the first transcript that this person has received then there's also a whole lot of context lost in how much we do play around with what is serious and then with what is uh uh joking so yes, that and would be I, I did first. receive an f bomb and then a no, Larry. So no, there are no uh, igloos at every, anybody's houses. Well, I'm just totally shocked because I'm confident that the TSA finds shower heads in every uh, piece of luggage they screen, and I would be very surprised if I didn't start knocking on doors and asking about igloos that the bathrooms were full of them. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's move on to comment number two from the same individual. It says, thank you for the FYP transcripts. I've submitted my core links email request to registrymatterscast at gmail.com, but have not yet received a reply. I would like to be included in the dialogue as a voice from the inside. There may be some value to my input. We've discussed this. I think it's within the last six months. I'm pretty sure. And we, you encourage me pretty much live on the program. It's like, you probably don't want to get into that. Cause if we do, then we're going to receive 8,000 email messages and we just can't handle it. I get enough email from people with questions. They go to you. We pick them up from other sources. I'm not saying that the value, the uh, input isn't valuable, but it would then start to get abused too. And that's, that's just a hard line to, to cross. If we had a volunteer, perhaps if someone wanted to step up and receive these email messages, we could uh, work something out like that. I would be receptive to that, but I was saying in pre-show, I just don't have the additional bandwidth. I'm already over, overextended, and I'm trying to downsize, so I don't have the capacity to have any more things thrown at me. So I cannot take that on, but I'm not opposed to someone doing it. We have hundreds and hundreds, literally hundreds of people who are listening out there on a regular basis. Maybe one of them might want to be our Core Links monitor, but I can't do it either. Okay. Moving right along then. I guess this will be, uh, this is question from Isaac. Yes, it is. All right. Um, to whom it may concern, I find your newsletter very informative. I've even recommended to others. I have a few questions, however. 
rumor is Indiana has talked about going up a uh, going up a civil commitment facility in the near future. Opening up, sorry, opening up a civil commitment facility in the near future. Do you know anything about these rumors? What all states have civil commitment? Am I, and then the third one, am I supposed to start lifetime parole when I get off of probation? Oh, I'm sorry. I am supposed to start lifetime parole when I get off probation. Shouldn't this be a violation of my rights since that wasn't in my plea? Fourth, the Second Amendment says the right to bear arms. How am I supposed to protect myself from being the victim of a hate crime again? I am part of three minorities and have been assaulted due to two of them. Respectfully, Isaac. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Larry, what's the first one? Well... I have not heard that rumor, but just let's be clear. I always like to take this moment to educate. As far as I know, all states have civil commitment. So let's be clear. We're talking about a different type of civil commitment, which as at present 20 states have. And I didn't check to see which 20 they are. I'm not going to uh, recite those 20 states and the federal government have a form of PFR specific civil commitment. It's not a, it's not a very good system because there are fewer protections. The standard of putting a person away is much lower, and the process for getting a person out is almost virtually non-existent in some, like in Minnesota. I think a handful have gotten out in the history of that program, but I do not know about anything uh, of that nature. Now, being at Indiana as a conservative state, if you were trying to fight that, and I realize he would have limited uh, uh, resources from where he's in prison, but you would want to remind those conservatives in Indiana that they are against big government and creating new things that will grow exponentially. And you would cite to the states where the programs have grown exponentially, like uh, uh, Minnesota and Virginia. And you would say, we just can't afford this. And, as, and to hold true to your conservative values, do not create this monster because it will grow and grow and grow. And that's the best argument you can come up with. And they may adhere to their conservative beliefs, or they may abandon them and magically do a flip-flop, which conservatives frequently do. But that's what I would, where I would start if I were trying to argue against that. So I can't give you the list of the 20 states that it takes care of number two. In lifetime parole, it may, it may be permissible. Even, I mean, there's just too much there to unpack on this program because we don't know what the law was at the time. If he's got lifetime probation, any post-prison supervision. If a statute existed, they failed to apprise him of that requirement. It could be that he could get out of the plea. That's probably not in his interest, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dodge that one. And then the Second Amendment, that's one of those things where since 1968, there have been prohibitions against felons and people who've, who've had various, well, they've actually added misdemeanor convictions like domestic violence to, the, to that prohibition. And they've also got people who've been committed to mental health facilities against their will, you know, involuntary commitment. Those people were forbidden to have a weapon. So Martha Stewart, who sold stock and did not tell the truth to the federal investigator, cannot lawfully own a firearm because, to my knowledge, she has not received a federal pardon for her federal crime, and I do not believe she can possess a weapon. But So, yes, that is a problem. And, again, if the NRA was as consistent as it pretends to be about, about that right, they would fight for restoration of those rights and a much more narrowly focused prohibition. But the NRA, like most org organizations, they're not consistent because they're afraid that that might alienate some of their donors or maybe many of their donors. So therefore, they don't take that posture. Back to the point three about lifetime parole. Now, lifetime parole when he gets off of probation? Isn't that, to me, that feels backwards? Parole is something that is like prison but not inside and then probation is what well, you're free with restrictions so well like i said i just don't feel like i have enough information to to, to be competent he he may have he may have a beef there uh, in terms of in terms of that i would suggest that to the extent he can he talk to a legal professional because i can't unpack that but he he may very well have a good cause of action i think there's been states like in tennessee where where I, I think they've imposed that on people retroactively and it was not a part of their negotiations. And just because they, they've done it doesn't make it constitutional, but they can do it until they're stopped. Okay. All right, back to that a recurring theme. They can do it until they're stopped. Then uh, last question, boy, and I get to read this one. This is going to be hard to read. Um, thank you for all the insight you give in your newsletters. 
They are much appreciated. My question to you is this. All states do have registries. Which states limit which, uh, which of the registries are listed on the internet? I am currently incarcerated and do not have internet resources to help out. Thank you for your time along with any help to my question. So Larry, can you just rattle off out of, off of your head which states limit who's on the listed on the internet? Well, let's, let's be clear. There, there's no state in our union that doesn't have at least a significant amount with it, of, of their PFRs listed. I think Minnesota might have the lowest ratio listed on the internet, but they're all states. All states have some segment of their PFRs listed, and it ranges all the way from anyone who's registered to, like in Arkansas, they have a risk-based system and they put the level two, I mean, the level threes and fours on the on the website. And Minnesota has a similar system. Vermont has a similar system unless, unless you have an offense against a minor. And then magically that prohibition goes away. And they did that a few years back as they expanded their law in Vermont. But still, in Vermont, it is a little bit better because they don't put your physical address. They put your city. But in terms of what he's trying to do, he's trying to state shop. And we don't really encourage state shopping. First of all, most people don't have the luxury of going to wherever they want to go. He may, because he's in federal custody, he may have that luxury. But when you state shop, you're assuming that the laws are stagnant and they cannot be changed. And they change all the time. If you look at the legislative history, you'll see that they change sometimes annually in, in certain states. The victim and the, uh, the law enforcement apparatus never feels like they have sufficient control. So the victim's advocates want more restrictions, and the law enforcement industrial complex wants more restrictions. So even if you were to have such a list, and even if you did have the resources to get to that state, that does not mean that that's the way the state's going to be. Yeah. be. Look at the states that had a uh, private list. Law enforcement only, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Wyoming, on and on. And people thought well, they were safe, and all of a sudden they were not safe. So, so we just don't encourage state shopping. But yeah, I, I appreciate and understand. If you could not be on the Internet, wouldn't you want to be uh, not be on the Internet? Who would want to be on the Internet if they didn't have to be? Uh, definitely not anybody. Nobody I know would want to be on it if they didn't have to be. Well, not in this, uh, actually, people want to be on the internet all the time with their social media, but in this particular <laughs> social media platform, this is one of those things where people are, are not uh, chomping at the bit. Like the Arkansas Registration Manual said some years back, it said that people who have been convicted of these offenses have the opportunity to register. And it was so hilarious because most people would have been happy to pass up that opportunity. I think I would probably pass that one up as well, to be honest uh, with you. So, um, but, I, all right. Um, well, so I uh, think he's we, got, he, go ahead. He's got a lot of he's got a lot of research to do to try to figure this out, and it may change by the time he gets released. Uh, and I didn't do any research to figure out what his projected release date is, but but it it may be that everything's changed by the time he gets out. Are you a first time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app. Hit the subscribe button and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F-Y-P. Okay. Um, I think then we can move over to the... Oh, there's one. Nope. Uh, I think you know, we're ready to go to the feature segment, um, I believe, Larry. I think we're there, right? I think, I think we are. And we have a very, very special guest that's going to be joining us if the phone connection has held. I hope so. Uh, Philip, can you I hope a so. quick little sound check? Yeah, sweet. You're still here. Excellent. And you haven't I'm fallen asleep. I'm still here. Well, you are Philip, and you are the uh, head person for the West Virginia affiliate of Narsal. And uh, you're a pretty smart cat, so we thought we would have you on because I made an analogy to Larry in the recent days or weeks comparing the position of Joe Manchin 
and what is coming down the pike from the federal legislation. I think it's called the Build Back Better plan. And the position that he is as a Democrat versus the position of the state being super red. And I'm not trying to play sides on that. That's just the reality of what they are. But I made the analogy with Larry. I said, yeah, it's definitely red. And uh, so I made the analogy that Joe Manchin is in a position where maybe he is a Democrat. Maybe he wants all the green things that could ever be. But the state doesn't really support that. So he has to figure out some line to toe in there. And uh, uh, anyway, and and vote according to what would potentially get him reelected, mostly. And uh, so thought you would be an excellent candidate to come on and discuss that and then also throw in the proposed changes to the AWA and we can all talk about that. But all that said, welcome. How are you? I'm doing absolutely wonderful, Andy. We, you and we, we've met a number like of times. Lots of fun. Oh, yeah, this is a great time. Um, we, we've met a number of times at the uh, Narsal conferences and I think that you're a stellar, stellar, great guy. Like you a lot. Oh, thank you, um, sir. So where do we go, Larry? What do you want to do? Well, what what Andy laid as the intro is really where I wanted to go in terms of public policy and how we formulate public policy and talking about as we elect people to represent us, what when are those people supposed to flip the middle finger and do whatever the hell they want? And when are they supposed <laughs> to represent the people that sent them there? And I get all these conflicted uh, I get all the time, well, they should just tell the people to go to hell. Well, that's, of course, your feeling when it when you disagree with the majority of the people. But they represent, whether it be a city council or a county commission or a county uh, board of supervisors or whether it be a state legislative district or whether it be U.S. House or the U.S. Uh, 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 Senate, they represent the people. So therefore, the people of West Virginia are not the same as the people of California or New York. So Manchin, being a member of the Senate and being one of 50 Democrats, and actually it's not that many, there was an independent, I think, so he's one of 49, but the other one caucuses with the Democrats for organizational reasons. But we've got an equally divided Senate. And what is he supposed to do? Because I'm quite certain if you were to take a poll about PFR issues in West Virginia, I'm doubting that there would be a massive uprising against the registry, and I'm suspecting that the people are pretty much happy with the laws as they exist or maybe want them to be tighter. So if you want Manchin to represent you on the Green Deal and oppose it because that's where the average West Virginian is, they think that that's kabuki because they want to keep their industries that they're familiar with in place. How is it that we can ask him to flip the middle finger on the stuff related to PFRs and he's supposed to vote for uh, against the Democrat Party, and he's supposed to represent the people of West Virginia. It confuses me a lot. When do you get to represent the people, and when do you get to tell the people to go to heck? You know, to go where it doesn't where it doesn't snow. Shine. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's no more shine. It's, it's definitely a challenge. That's for sure. And you can you can definitely say that West Virginia is a very red leading state, and Joe Manchin has been the senator in West Virginia for a lot of years. But Joe has never been a left left senator. He's always been you know, center left at at the at the at the farthest away. He's been center left. Um, but yeah, in West Virginia. They're not chomping at the bits to increase um, registry law and make it harder, but they're also not chomping at the bit to roll it back where you would see, you know, m- most reform, you know, liberal movements moving to. Um, but Joe has stuck around for a lot of years by being a centrist. He's been in the center for a long time. He's he's an old timer. He believes in in bipartisanship. And at the same time, you know, he's not looking to you know, gut the entire West Virginia economy and all the coal-producing jobs. Um, he still has to have that balance and weigh, you know, weigh in with what his constituents want. And you know, there's definitely uh, in, in West Virginia and Kentucky, coal is a major, major thing. 
turning that all over to a green, a new green world is, is not something I think Joe is totally against, but he certainly doesn't want to do it in five year plans, that's for sure. So it's a challenge, a balancing act challenge for sure. Well, that's what the lefties don't seem to understand. You take someone like AOC, and I can't pronounce all of her names, so I'm just going to let that go sufficiently. We can put it. We can put it in <laughs> the glossary. Alessandro Ocasio Cortez. We can put it in the there glossary of what what it stands for. But those people are tone deaf to the differences in the United States, so they represent a district or a state. In her case, she's in the House, so she's representing a district, and they just assume that since they have broad support from their constituents, that somehow or another. Their courage is something that should just translate around to places where they don't look at things the same way. Texas is not the same as California. We were just there. And you can, you can uh, uh, cite how many people were wearing masks when we were there, 150 people. What would you say as you scan the audience of how many of the 150 actually were masked up during the presentations? It was a very small number. Uh, I yeah, can think of one small. person that was adamant about wearing uh, a mask. Yeah. Had had no, you been had you been in New England, you would have seen a lot higher. Even in New Mexico, you would have seen a lot higher percentage of people. In fact, you would have been almost unanimous, a hundred percent here, because we have a public. Uh, when you're in public, you have to be masked, and very few people defy that. But in Texas, but somehow the lefties don't get that. But it, when when we're talking about things as PFRs go. We somehow find such disdain for that they just don't have any backbone. They just don't go buck the people, and they just don't do the right thing. Well, in my view, over time, transitioning away from the type of energy that we've been using for 100 years is probably in our best interest over the long term. But it's going to be disruptive, as all change is. It's going to be painful, as we went from agriculture to industrialization. And we went from industrialization to the technical revolution when we lost a lot of industrial jobs that paid well and had nice benefits. But in the meantime, Joe Manchin, who's also been governor of that state, if, if I remember right, he was the governor. and he, yeah. I mean, he served that state for a long, long time. And he has been a centrist, and I would say centrist to the right more than to the left. Politically, he's been, he's been at the center and maybe, maybe leaning to the right. But that's where he has to be. He could not get elected. If he were out on the lefty land where AOC is, he just couldn't. The, the people in West Virginia would not vote for him. Well, the same. Oh, no, it's they, absolutely certain he could not get elected. And if if he was to lose his seat, it would absolutely be filled by a Republican. Oh, yeah. and, and so that that's what I struggle with all the time when the, the party is so adamant. You'll either vote our way. Or we don't want you. Well, first of all, the Democratic Party used to be a broad and welcoming party. and You had a broad diversity in the Democratic Party across the political spectrum. You had the same thing in the Republican Party. You had liberal and moderate Republicans, and both parties have polarized. But back to the PFR issue, what do you expect? Well, that's where the people are on the issue. They do not want to see things lightened up on PFRs, and they make that known. Believe me, they make that known. When there's any hint of lightning up, there is an outcry about it. News media goes crazy. The phones light up in the legislative offices. I answer them. I know that for a fact. So, so the people are not ready for that. So what are they supposed to do? It's a good question. Let me, so, uh, yeah, and uh, explain further, Larry, in that if, if, so say you voted for Joe Manchin because he was a coal supporter and then this registry stuff comes up on the plate. I, I realize that you would want him to vote for the PFR stuff, but your coal job is there. And I wanted you to go into about the other issues that they may work on. And this is something that like, this isn't their, their pet project. A lot of people get elected because they're like, I'm going to focus on schools, uh, focus on jobs. I'm going to focus on economy. They, they get there on their signature platform, but then these tangentially, not even tangentially, these other issues come up that like, it's not their pet project. What are they supposed to do with those? Well, what they generally do is they, they look as best they can. And I should say we, because I'm a part of that process. We look at where we think the public is based on what we know the reaction is going to be. 
Well, I can automatically tell you at our state that the news media would go ballistic if you started because that's where the people are and that would drive their ratings through the roof. And in a capitalist system, ratings is what you live or die by. So, so we would say, gee, we're going to get killed on this in the media. And therefore, we would lay low in the grass. What you do when you're in politics is you lay low in the grass and you hope someone that has a little bit safer seat posture that they're in. Manchin is not in a safe seat. I mean, he did squeak out a, a, a re-election in his last go-round, but it was not a barn burner by any means, no. Philip. I mean, what was it, like three points maybe? Yeah, he, yeah he I was, think it was either three or four points. And, and he, he is not in a position to burn capital on this issue. So if there were to be federal legislation, he would lay low in the grass and he would let others take the lead on that. And he would vote how he felt that he would suffer the least damage politically because this is not an issue that he can gain any political uh, advantage with. This is not something that would gain him votes. It isn't. I hate to tell you folks, but it would not gain you votes to be soft on crime, in particular soft on PFRs. So therefore, it's something that's p- p- politically toxic, and you're, you're going to stay away from it. <laughs> you're going to vote. That's why the votes are always 100 percent or very close to it, because you see it as political toxicity if you touch it. Someone just posted in comments, Philip, maybe you can speak to this. Just imagine the attack ads if he didn't lay low. Oh, yeah, there were there were definitely be lots of attack ads. Um, he's up for re-election in 24. Not really sure that he's going to run again. He's, I believe, 74 at this point. Um, but, yeah, if, if in, in a red state like we are, anytime anything is raised that even remotely goes out and wants to challenge the registry, the attack ads just start uh, on the nightly news is, you know, the only thing you see on the news, it seems like. So what else, Larry? What else is important to know about from the registry side of voting and then the general population? Isn't this where it would be really important for things to get killed in committee so they don't come to a vote? Absolutely. Everything that we are angry about now, we're angry because the committee process broke down and finally let it through. At the federal level, the international Megan's Law, when the Congress was under Democrat control, it was able to be bottled up by a few key people, particularly in the Senate. But when you when the majority shifts, people don't really pay attention to this. When the majority shifts, the committee chairs shift also, because one of the perks of being in the majority is you get to name the chairs of the committee. And the ratios are representative of the ratio of advantage you have over the other other party. So right now, the committees are in the Senate, they're 50-50 because that's what the ratio is. So the rule that they're operating under now is a shared power agreement where anything that can't pass out of committee, say if every Democrat votes no and every Republican votes yes, you've got a tie. So they're agreed, they have agreed as the share, sharing power process to send that onto the floor. But normally, if they were a 52-48, then all the, the Senate committees would be one more than they is of the of the minority party. And that would mean if they vote in lockstep, you kill it in committee. So when the when the Republicans took control of the of, of the Senate in 2014, that shifted the committee control as well. So the committee chair, I believe, was Leahy or the key committee. I'm not sure. It's been a few years now back, but but the the Democrats had control, and the IML was being bottled up. Well, that shifted just. I mean, that's just that magic. <laughs> when the when the majority party shifts, the committee chair shifts, and the majority party controls the flow of what gets heard in committee. They control the flow. You hear all this time that you heard Mitch was blocking this. He would not allow a vote. Mitch wouldn't allow a vote. Well, that same thing happens in the House. If you're in the majority, you can block you can block votes. The rules are slightly different in the House of Representatives, but blocking votes, you don't want this crap to get to the floor. You cannot let it get to the floor. It will be voted. It will be approved on the floor. That happens time and time again. You have to stop it in committee. And that's just the reality of the situation. It works the same way at the state level. If it gets to the floor, it's going to pass. I mean, it's too toxic not to vote for it. That's absolutely right. They they did distance restrictions in West Virginia six years ago for those who are on supervision. 
And as soon as that law was passed, I was like, okay, the next step is all the rest of us. And sure, sure enough, the next year they introduced it. It was on. It was introduced five years running. This last year, it got taken out. It was not reintroduced. But for five years, uh, we, you know, obviously we got together and we we spoke out against it, and um, it died. We got it to die in committee every one of those years. But that was that was the ultimate goal was to get it killed in committee. So. Yep, and, and what people is, are really not familiar with the committee process. And the committee is where the public gets input. It's where the where the real in depth dive goes. Yes, they do have floor debate, but the real experts come in and testify in a committee setting. You don't when you're on the floor. It's debate among the members. It's not a debate right. among the public. So your real involvement and the real expertise comes in the committee process. They have analysts that look at these things. They take public comment in both states. I'm told that, that, that there's a couple of states where they don't allow public comment, but as a general rule, public comment comes in and you're allowed to say what you want to say. You may only get one, two or three minutes, but you're allowed to speak. And you have every right as a PFR to show up at your capital. And when I say that, I'm going to get a, a, an email from North Carolina. They're going to tell me, Larry, you don't seem to realize that North Carolina has the capitals within an exclusion zone. And PFRs are not allowed to go there because of that. And I just tell people, well, you know what, I'm allowed to petition government for redress of my grievances, and I would go to the Capitol anyway. But that's easy for me to say because I would fight back. But but uh, but even if you can't go to the Capitol, you can participate other ways in the in that process. What other stuff yeah, is absolutely. going on in, uh, in West Virginia, Philip? Uh, is there any activity at the legislative le uh, level that you guys are looking out for and going to try and stop and whatnot? Nah, there's not a whole lot of active stuff going on. We we have an annual legislature, so we don't we don't have you know a full year running or twice a year, so it's once a year. The biggest thing over the last couple of years has been the distance restriction, but glad to see that it's not been reintroduced and hoping that it'll stay that way. Um, we're looking at um, trying to raise funds and look at adding on or having the le forcing the legislature to have a way to get off of the registry in West Virginia. Currently, there there is no way off of the registry. There's no no legislative process for redress whatsoever. whatsoever. Hmm. You only have like 50 people on the registry in West Virginia, right? Just a little over 6,000. And there's a handful of people who are designated as um, what they call uh, violent predators. But it's it's West Virginia is definitely not the place, not the worst place in the union to be for a registry. It's certainly not Florida, let's put it that way. But there are there are definitely worse places to be than West Virginia. But for example, the not being able to get off the registry is something that we certainly want to try and get onto the books so that we have a. Um, that gotcha. should that should be very appealing to your conservative lawmakers who profess such a belief in small and limited government. So you know, the Absolutely. cost, you know, that, that, so that that would be one of your talking points. Now, West Virginia probably offloads this to the counties, which is quite common around the country. There's only a handful of states where they actually do it at the state level. So you get to you get to disguise the cost and it's, and it's absorbed by the counties. Is that the way they do it in West Virginia? Do you register with the county? Yeah, you register. State police control the the registration, and it's registered in every you in the counties. It's centralized, but it's the county levels to do all the registration. Yeah, so they they get to absorb the cost, and it's the county officials that come out and check on you, the sheriff or whoever. And uh, yeah, but that absolutely. that that that's now if you really want to have fun with them, you go talk to a conservative lawmaker and you say, you know what, I've been thinking about this damn thing. And it sure is one of those unfunded mandates that conservatives really profess that they hate. And you know, we're having an unfunded mandate to the local governments who are already struggling to provide basic services, you know, where you, your local governments provide your most basic service like trash and parks and, and law enforcement, county jail, whatnot. And they're stressed to the limit. So what we ought to do is remove this unfunded mandate and let's make sure that it's handled by the state or at the very minimum that the state pays the counties for doing it. 
and then we can get a more clear picture of what it's costing because right now it's just being absorbed by the counties and this is just such a horrible thing that we're shoving on our counties that's your strategy and you'll actually be able to find out how ingenuous disingenuous they might be or how honest they might be about their belief in unfunded mandates because they'll roll their eyes and say i've never thought about that no sheriff has ever complained of course no sheriff ever would complain because if you complained about the registry it would be adverse to your electability as a sheriff. Nobody wants to hear complaints <laughs> about the registry. So every sheriff says, I'm happy to do that because it, to say otherwise <laughs> would be would, would jeopardize their electability. But, but that would be yeah, a good absolutely. way to have a conversation. And let's find out how conservative these people are about unfunded mandates and how much they believe in not piling things on local government and see if they really are sincere. And, and you, I mean, you can keep a straight face because that is an honest dialogue to have with a conservative lawmaker. So they have some good tact. So, uh, but Do you want to uh, move over but, to the SORNA stuff, Larry? Or are we done? Well, I wanted, I, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about the, my picture because there's a reason that picture is yes. up there. So, folks, there's a picture of me running a buffing machine. And for those of you, <laughs> for, for those of you who do not know what a buffer is, uh, I'm going to try to make the story somewhat succinct, but to make to make it as funny as I possibly can, I'm going to add a little bit of levity here. That machine is used for stripping and waxing and polishing floors, and uh, that's probably an old thing. Now the machines are you ride them in a seat and they, they're big and they, you know they're bulky. They they run on their own power. But this this is a, a machine that would have been very commonly used in the 70s and 80s. And I went to school as a as a aide to the janitorial staff in the early 70s on a youth summer program. And there was four of us teenage boys, and two of them were very strong athletes. One of them was a large, hefty guy, but not an athlete, and one was a nerdy, kind of skinny guy. And that was I was the nerd. And I just could not understand why the buffing machine was so difficult to operate because I saw these strong boys and they were struggling with it. And after an hour, they would be they would be tired and they'd be sweating and they couldn't operate the buffing machine. Well, I didn't have the strength they did. So I said, how the heck are they? I mean, we got these older guys. They were running the buffer. They were 60 years old. You know, one of them for sure was in his 60s. And I said, these old men are doing this and they're not they're not fatigued. And that there's, a, there's a secret. I don't know. So I asked one of the old guys. I said, you know, there's something that I don't know about this machine. I'm doing something wrong. How do you operate this thing? He says, well, I'm glad you asked. He said, most of these strong punks, I don't think he said punks, but he inferred that, you know, smart uh, kids, teenagers, they don't care to learn anything because they already know it all. And he said, now that you ask, he said, it's really easy. He said, the handle, you go up when you want the buffer to move to the right, and you go down on the handle when you want the buffer to move to the left, and you hold it steady and balance it like a bicycle when you want the buffer to stay in one spot. He said, it's just that simple. I started doing it, and amazingly, the buffer did exactly what I wanted it to do. And if you learn how a process works, you can actually be successful. Now, I've simplified that, but the legislative process, it actually works exactly the way they've designed it over our 240-year history. It works the way it was designed. And if you would accept the political reality of we work in a, in a process by which people must stand before the voters and be affirmed. And when the voters are outraged, they're likely not to affirm their presence. If you'll accept that, and if you'll accept that the legislative rules that exist have been, they've, they've developed over generations, and you're not going to change them. If you'll actually learn how to work in that system, you'll be a, not maybe as successful as I was at learning the buffer, but you'll actually learn how to be successful, and your success rate will go up. If you quit fighting it, like those boys did that were trying to struggle to run the buffer with brute strength, and actually learn how what is done is being done and why the results are the way they are. It's really not as complicated as people make it. Great analogy. <laughs> so, and Philip, I think you could affirm that. Once you've started learning the process, you just described the success rate of what, five years straight? Yep, five years. And but yeah, that's knew, a great analogy. You knew where to go to stop the bill before it got to the floor because you knew if it got to the floor, what would happen? Dead in the water. That buffer was going to go all over the place. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't going to like it. 
<laughs> so, so folks, try to learn the process. Don't resent the process. It is what it is. We're a democratic society. We affirm our leaders periodically, and they are, are a reflection of who we are and what we want. And I think, I think that was the real point of having Philip here was that West Virginians want different things than what people in San Francisco or what Queens, New York might want. You know, that it's a whole different, this country is vast and diverse and what people want and how they communicate those wants and needs to their lawmakers are different. You have po poverty galore, the Mississippi Delta. The needs in the Mississippi Delta are different than what they are in Silicon Valley. So a per person who's answering a congressional staffer's phone in Silicon Valley is going to be dealing with a whole different series of questions and inquiries than they are in, in the Mississippi Delta. Okay, um, let's move over to this uh, AWA regulation changes. Larry, I looked up using the Google and I found that we did this on episode 139, uh, Sorry, 138 even, and it came out in it came out August 3rd of last year. So just a hair over a year ago is when we talked about this prior to. So there was like a, I saw chatter everywhere. Like, when are we going to talk about this? Like, I think we may already have done it. So what are we doing with this? Well, we're just trying to clarify what's going on. the The Adam Walsh Act was passed in 2006. And it was signed by none other than George W. Bush, who was president at the time. And no intent to knock George W. Bush. It got to George W. Bush, and he signed it. If it had gotten to a President Albert Goa, he would have signed it. If it had gotten to a President Ronald Reagan, he would have signed it. So this is no disparaging of George W. Bush. But the Congress delegated the U.S. Attorney General, at that time was Alberto Gonzalez, to figure out with the 50 states and the territories what could be done to achieve the greatest level of compliance that could possibly be achieved with the intent of the federal legislation. And the uh, Attorney General at the time published an interim rule, and then they published final rules. Those final rules went out for comment. There was a comment period. Nothing changed. I, I think maybe one thing changed about juveniles, and that may have even changed after the final rule was promulgated, but very little change from the time the Gonzalez Attorney General Office of the, of the United States put out the pr proposal until they were adopted and beca they became the way that the Adam Walsh Act was implemented. Well, there have been some modifications and new rules have been promulgated along in these intervening years, but the bottom line is this is a law of the United States. It is the desire of the Congress, and presumably the people, because they elected the members of Congress, that this be the law of our land. And the job of the executive branch is to implement the will of the people. So the Trump administration proposed an additional set of guidelines, which would make it easier for states to come into compliance. Basically, the states would be able to administratively do what legislatures haven't done. So they kind of came up with a proposal that would allow the states kind of a, a backdoor way to comply if they chose to do that. And many states will do that. Well, when, when Trump did not win re-election, the new administration decided to put everything on hold. They, they did that not because they had any desire to help PFRs. They did that because they wanted to stop some of Trump's last minute changes. Administrations leaving power typically try to make changes on things, public policy that they don't agree with. And the fear was of the Biden administration, they were going to change environmental uh, regulations, that they were going to allow the open the dumping of toxic waste and all this kind of stuff. And to seem fair, they said, well, we're going to put a moratorium on new regulations that the Trump people have proposed, and we're going to look at them and see that they're appropriate. Well, they looked at these, and they found that they were very appropriate and consistent with the intent of uh, Adam Walsh Act, and they said, these are good to go. That's, in an essence, in three three and a half minutes. That's what's going on here. The Trump proposal has been accepted by the Biden administration, and it's going to be recorded in the federal registry, register, not registry, and the states will have the green light to try to bypass their legislative process, and they will try to tighten their uh, rules as they pertain to PFRs. I mean, is there anything else you need to know? <laughs> Why, why is there so much chatter all of a sudden then? 
if this people has been have, in place for a year and some change or on, people, in the pipeline? People have forgotten. It's like Americans have relatively short focuses and short memories, and, and they, they've forgotten that, that this is on the agenda. It's been on the agenda for so long. I mean, there's nobody that remembers hardly who signed the, the Out of Bolshek. They, uh, it's like that's ancient history. But this, this is uh, through all the controversy of uh, uh, January 6th, recounts and lawsuits and everything. People have forgotten this, but it's, it's, it's old news. And the bottom line is that there really isn't anything that can be done administratively. And I'll tell you why. This administration is not going to take any political risk. The, the, first of all, the Attorney General, uh, 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 Merrick Garland, he put his hand on a Bible. And he swore that he was going to un- enforce the laws of the United States. This is a law of the United States. So he's going to do his best to enforce this law. And, but but there's, the, there's the political angle. He is not going to stick his neck out to throw the bra- – oh, here's the Democrats. Uh, here's what you're facing if, if, you, if you wear the Democratic banner right now in 2022, which is fast approaching the midterms where we'll elect the entire House of Representatives and one-third of the U.S. Senate. What we're looking at is a person saying, well, we kind of need to be a little bit soft on the PFRs. Well, the Republicans and the conservatives, are going to, they're going to hit them on, on bail reform because the Democrats are making it where people can just sign their – they don't have to post any money in some of the states because that's this big thing about cash bail is oppressive. So, so they've got them on bail reform. They've got them on defunding the police. So if you're Democrat candidates, you're, you're trying to defund and destroy law enforcement. You're trying to dismantle qualified immunity, which makes the good officers uh, vulnerable to all these crazy, ridiculous lawsuits. You know, they're trying to to let prisoners go. I mean, they're for soft on crime. And so you've already got that coming at you if you're a Democratic candidate. So would you want to add the additional stuff about PFRs if you're running as a Democrat in 2022? I think not. So that's the reason why nobody in their right mind would do this. But now, at FYP, we try to be fair. And there was a Republican president. He was a candidate at one time, but he became president. And he got vilified for sticking his neck out. So we have a person who ran for president in 1988, who ultimately got elected. But he made a pledge that there was gonna, not going to be any revenue increases, because that's one of the things as a Republican, you cannot ever consider raising taxes. That's, that's a cardinal sin to increase taxes. But the deficit widened in 1990 because of the, of the uh, uh, there was, that was the year that, uh, it, that a, uh, Kuwait got invaded by Iraq, and we had a disruption of oil supplies. The budget deficit, the economy was already somewhat soft, and the budget deficit ballooned. I mean, it was very small by today's standards, but there was this talk about fiscal responsibility back in those days, and this person decided that Fiscal responsibility was more important than that pledge and decided that taxes needed to be increased. And this person and their re-election campaign got vilified over and over and over and over again with, read my lips. It was played relentlessly. And that's the type of thing. It does work both ways. But see, I can't undo 30 years of history. I, I can't do anything about that. I can't. Make that go away. I can only call on people who are doing it today to stop doing it, and they're not going to stop doing it. So then I have to tell you that since that's going to happen, that's the reason why this administration is not going to pull back on the Trump administration's proposal. It's really that simple, folks. Nothing complicated about it. I don't want to leave Philip out of the conversation layer. Is there anything to direct bat and back and forth with Philip? in the uh in the conversation read my lips <laughs> <laughs> no, okay <no> taxes <laughs> but but philip i mean you, do you understand where how i'm analyzing this i mean as my analysis I, I totally totally understand it and totally agree with it there's there's totally there's, agree with the analysis there's not a prayer's chance that this administration is going to pull back on this proposal. First of all, it didn't create it. So therefore, nope. it's merely following the previous administration. So if they were to pull, 
can, there's a there's a former president that used to have like what was it how many you know, followers before he was kicked off social media was it 60 million or I, I've lost track but I mean potentially this former president would vilify them as well saying how yeah. you know not only not only have they ruined the economy and they've let criminals out with no bail and the you know, I mean they're defunding the police and they're they're t- tearing down qualified immunity but now they're turning the sex offenders loose. So I mean, it's this just is not probably going. the one thing that Trump did in his entire time in office that this administration is not going to mess with. <laughs> 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 uh, I think I just had something that I wanted to bring up, but then it left my brain and I forgot it. Larry, I think we're I, we're at a, a little over an hour. Do you how much more do you want to do? Oh, I th- I think I'm happy with it because you know, basically what I want to get across to people is that these regulations it would be the most long shot. I mean, you can, if you feel good sending an email, please send the email to your to the Attorney General's of the United States office. If you feel good like making a phone call, if all these things make you feel good, please do them. But don't expect a whole lot in the way of results because this is baked in the cake. Yeah, and, and if you really oh, yeah, want to see, change, I just remembered, Larry, is Gundy right? This is this is the administrative state. There's no voting for this, n- none of that. This is them, the the federal Congress level, telling the organization that does this, "Hey, you guys need to do your job." Well, uh, sort of. This is the the Attorney General was uh, was assumed. Everybody would generally assume the Attorney General of the United States would have the capacity to figure out. The state various state constitutions and what you could do. No one ever expected, to my knowledge, that all 50 states would be in substantial compliance because that's the reason why they did that delegation. They said, well, we're not smart to figure that out here in terms of, of, of all the nuances of the various state constitutions and the state uh, existing court decisions as it pertains to PFR. So they said, Department of Justice, figure this out, set up a regulatory framework and make it possible for as many states as possible to, to gain substantial compliance. That is what Alberto Gonzalez set into motion in 2006, and that is what's continued through the various administrations through Obama, through, through W. Bush, and through Trump, and now with Biden. They're going to continue to seek substantial compliance as long as that's the law and the will of the people that we have in Adam Walsh Act. If you really want to see it go away, then seek a member of your congressional delegation to start an effort, and you can start with Rep- Representative Bobby Scott because he's not big and keen on the Adam Walsh Act, but you're going to need some Republican support because you're not going to get Democratic support until Republicans are on board with dismantling the Adam Walsh Act. But until that happens, it's really it's really a long shot. We're going to be challenging as the states administratively implement this. There will be challenges launched. I will be doing my best to monitor, and with your help, we'll be figuring out where to launch these challenges. But this is going to keep going, folks. Uh, you know, it's it's on the books, and they're not going to abandon it. It's their job to enforce the law. Remember, they put their hand. Uh, Merrick Garland put his hand on that Bible, and that's what he's going to do. All right, um, Larry. Someone in chat's telling me that they sent me an email message. Uh, they emailed me a voicemail message, and boy, oh boy, I gotta find it real quick, or else he's going to get very mad at me. Well, let's just do it next week. We are out of time, and you've still got the secret uh, stuff to do, the, the mystery speaker, whatever we call that, that segment. That is true. Yes. Who is that speaker? All right. Then uh, is, is it? tell me if it's really, really important, and we'll try and get it and squeeze it in. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll move on, and we will do the new patrons this week. Why don't I even have that pulled up? Like, that's coming up after we finish recording, because like, like, this is for the patron people. This isn't for the... The regular gotcha. Joes, that was the whole point of that. Gotcha. Um, let me, let's do, while I, while I find the patrons, I will do the Who's That Speaker. So last week, Larry, we played this one. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire. Okay, and I cut that off on purpose because I thought it was going to give away too much stuff at that point. Uh, who was that, Larry? That would be Franklin D. Roosevelt. And that was given to us accurately by J.S. And, uh, wow, something is happening. On, okay, there it is. Yeah, J.S., that's like the 
sections have been duplicated. All right, that's what I'm confused with. And all right, so JS, thank you very much for writing that in. And so this week we have, um, it's already sort of been teased this evening, but you're going to have to give me a lot of detail about this one because it's going to be obvious who it is. So don't just send me the name and don't scream it out in chat. You got to like send it to registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And um, yeah, so here we go. My opponent won't rule out raising taxes, but I will and the Congress will push me to raise taxes and I'll say no. And they'll push and I'll say no. And they'll push again and I'll say to them, read my lips. No new taxes. Like I said, you got to send me a lot of detail. That could be like where it happened. What was the date of it? Obviously, give me the name, but you can't just do the easy part. Yeah, say the tell- name Because if you don't know who the name is. Tell Taylor? us, tell us, tell us the uh, the backdrop of where that happened because that should still be fairly easy to figure out. So, well, alrighty. If there's a person have... in chat, Larry. There's a person in chat that's 15 years younger than me, so I don't even think like they don't know who that is. So, well, it'll be easy to figure out. I would think so. I would think so. Um, new patrons this week. We had Audra and God. I think there's another one, Larry. I really, really, really do. Um, and I do have the message from the individual that I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna code play this Larry and I boy I hope it works. I will try and do all my things. It's important for the 200th episode. Hello there, Registry Matters. This is Brian in Louisiana, saying congratulations on 200 episodes and 100 patrons. And Shad, let me tell you something else. Whether I'm sitting on my oil platform in the Gulf, or down the bayou, or up the river, there ain't no place I'd rather be on Saturday night. And hanging out with Larry and Andy and the rest of you people. Except for maybe <laughs> watching football in Tiger Stadium. And that's for show. Sure. Ooh, Tiger Stadium. I think that's LSU. LSU Tigers, right, Larry? I think so. But Philip's probably better better guy on that. So well, he said not when it comes person. to sports. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, but yeah, we had, uh, we had Kevin come in as a new patron and then Audra also come in as a new patron. Thank you all so very much. And I think Larry, um, visit the show notes, registry, like there's nothing else to cover, right? We're done. We're done. And it was really fun having Philip here. And, and, and I think we're going to have you on a more regular basis because you need to balance this liberalism of these two. <laughs> very good. I was glad Phillip. to be here. I really appreciate you coming in on pretty short notice and contributing. And yeah, we will definitely uh, put you on the short list to come back. And you are the head person in charge of the state of West Virginia. Executive the- director of West Virginia for rational sexual offense law, sir. Thank you very much. How can people contact you? WVRSOL at gmail.com. Beautiful. Thank you all very much. So find the show notes over at registrymatters.co. Leave voicemail at 747-227-4477. Registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And as the patrons are about to enjoy the, uh, for us achieving, not only just going over 100, but like smashing it, that uh, I'm about to play a little uh, performance for, for you people. And uh, so there you go. And that is at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash registrymatters. With that, Larry, thank you very much, everybody, and have a great night. And those that are here in chat, stick around, and and I'll take a little time, and we'll do our thing. See you all later. Thanks, Philip. Good night, Larry. Good night. Thanks. Good Good night. And thanks for this awesome audience in chat. It's unbelievable how many people are here. Thanks. You've been listening to FYP.